हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम और वेलकम बैक टू लॉ फॉर आई एम विदिशा बैनर्जी अ फर्स्ट ईयर लॉ स्टूडेंट एट डीएनएलयू जबलपुर टुडे वी आर गोना हैव अ रीडिंग कॉम्प्रिहेंशन प्रैक्टिस सेशन एंड विदाउट फर्दर डिले लेट्स गेट इनटू द वीडियो दिस इज आवर फर्स्ट पैसेज लेट्स रीड एंड अंडरस्टैंड the defoliation of millions of acres of trees by massive infestations of gypsy moth caterpillars is a recurring phenomena in the northeastern united states in studying these outbreaks scientists have discovered that affected trees fight back by releasing toxic chemicals mainly phenols into their foliage these noxious substances limit caterpillar's growth and reduce the number of eggs that female moths lay Phenols also make the eggs smaller which reduces the growth of the following year's caterpillars because the number of eggs a female moth produces is directly related to her size and because her size is determined entirely by her feeding success as a caterpillar the tree's defensive mechanism has an impact on moth fecundity so let's understand this first paragraph here it is being said that caterpillars that destroy trees in massive amounts are gypsy are found in the northeastern united states and the study is based upon those gypsy moth caterpillars who are destroying the foliage of a million trees now in studying these outbreaks scientists have discovered what that the trees have a defense mechanism in which they release toxic chemicals called phenols which the caterpillars consume and hence because their feeding is infected by toxic substances the eggs they produce is reduced by number and the female moth size reduces this is how the fertility of caterpillars reduces as a result of consuming phenols that are produced by the trees in a process to defend themselves from the attack of these gypsy moths Now let's read the second paragraph. The gypsy moth is also subject to attack by the nucleophily hydrosis virus or wilt disease, a particularly important killer of the caterpillars in outbreak years. Caterpillars contract wilt disease when they eat a leaf to which the virus encased in a protein globule has become attached. Once ingested by a caterpillar the protein globule dissolves releasing thousands of viruses or virions that after about 2 weeks multiply enough to fill the entire body cavity when the caterpillar dies the virions are released to the outside encased in a new protein globule synthesized from the caterpillar tissues and ready to be picked up by other caterpillars In this paragraph we see the effect of wilt disease in the gypsy moth caterpillars and how the disease works to kill the caterpillars Now let's read the next para knowing that phenols including tannins often act by associating with and altering the activity of proteins researchers focused on the effects on caterpillars of ingesting the virus and leaves together they found that on tannin rich oak leaves the virus is considerably less effective at killing caterpillars than when it is on aspen leaves which are lower in phenols in general the more concentrated the phenols in tree leaves the less deadly the virus thus while highly concentrated phenols in tree leaves reduce caterpillar population by limiting the size of caterpillars and consequently the size of females egg cluster the same chemicals also help caterpillars survive by disabling wilt virus Forest stands of red oaks with their tannin rich foliage may even provide caterpillars with safe havens from the disease in stands dominated by trees such as aspen however incipient gypsy moth outbreaks are quickly suppressed by viral epidemics now we see that the third para is the link between the first two paragraphs the first paragraph spoke about the effect of phenols on gypsy moth caterpillars and the second one spoke about wilt disease now in the third paragraph we see that the same phenol that was responsible for lowering the size of the caterpillar and reducing the size of egg clusters is also responsible for protecting caterpillars from wilt disease 
Next, further research has shown that caterpillars become virtually immune to the wilt virus as the trees on which they feed respond to increasing defoliation. The tree's own defenses raise the threshold of caterpillar vulnerability to the disease, allowing populations to grow denser without becoming more susceptible to infection. For these reasons, the benefits to the caterpillars of ingesting phenols appear to outweigh the costs. Given the presence of the virus, the tree's defensive tactic apparently has backfired. Now, let's see the questions. The paragraph ends here. Which of the following statements best expresses the main point of the passage? Recurring outbreaks of infestation by gypsy moth caterpillars have had a devastating impact on trees in the northeastern United States. This is possible, but this cannot be the main point. Let's read the other options. A mechanism used by trees to combat the threat from gypsy moth caterpillars has actually made some trees more vulnerable to that threat. This one seems very probable, but let's read the other options before deciding if this is the answer. Although deadly to gypsy moth caterpillars, wilt disease has failed to significantly affect the population density of caterpillars. No, this is absolutely contrary to what the passage says. The passage says that wilt disease has reduced the population density of caterpillars. The next option says the tree species with the highest levels of phenols in their foliage are the most successful in defending caterpillars themselves against gypsy moth. No, in the last line we saw that how the defense mechanism of the trees have backfired and how actually phenols are more useful to the caterpillars than harmful. The last option says, in their efforts to develop new methods for controlling gypsy moth caterpillars, researchers have focused on the effects of phenols in tree leaves on the insect's growth and reproduction. No, researchers have not tried to develop any methods. They have just conducted a study seeing how the moth fertility is affected by natural phenols and tannins. This is not what the, ma uh, what the main point of the passage is. So, option B is the correct answer. The main point of the passage is a mechanism used by trees to combat the threat from gypsy moth caterpillars is producing phenols. Has actually made some trees more vulnerable to that threat. This is the answer. The next question asks, in the line 12 to 14, the phrase, the tree's defensive mechanism has an impact on moth fecundity, refers to which of the following phenomena. Now, in this case, we won't go back to the passage and count which one is line 12 to 14. We should remember what the gist of the passage is and we saw that phenols were reducing the fecundity of the moth in the first paragraph. Remember that and let's see the option and try to answer the question. Female moths that ingest phenols are more susceptible to wilt virus which causes them to lay smaller eggs. No. Highly concentrated phenols in tree leaves limit caterpillars' food supply, thereby reducing the gypsy moth population. Limit caterpillars' food supply is absolutely makes absolutely no sense. Phenols attack the protein globule that protects moth egg clusters, making them vulnerable to wilt virus and lowering their survival rate. Absolutely no, because uh, phenols were supposed to be useful in preventing wilt virus. Phenols in oak leaves drive gypsy moths into forest stands dominated by aspens where they succumb to viral epidemics. No, I don't see this as relevant as well. The last option, the consumption of phenols by caterpillars result in undersized female gypsy moths which tend to produce small egg clusters. This is exactly what the first paragraph said. So this is the correct answer. The correct answer for question number two is option E. Let's move to the next question. It can be inferred from the passage that wilt disease virions depend for their survival on protein synthesized from the tissues of a host caterpillar. This was given in the end of the second paragraph. So I think A is the correct answer, but let's read the other options once. Aspen leaves with high concentration of phenols, no. Tannin-rich oak leaves, no. These are the answers that may confuse you, but you have to rely solely on what was stated in the paragraph to answer this type of questions. Nutrients that they synthesize from gypsy moth egg clusters, no, they don't get any nutrients 
from the egg clusters of gypsy moths, a rising threshold of caterpillar vulnerability to wilt disease. No, the wilt disease virions depend for their survival on option number A, protein synthesized from the tissues of a host caterpillar. This is a long question, so we need to read it carefully to be accurate. Which of the following, if true, would most clearly demonstrate the operation of the tree's defensive mechanism as it is described in the first paragraph of the passage? Caterpillars feeding on red oaks that were more than 50% defoliated grew to be only two-thirds the size of those feeding on trees with relatively intact foliage. Oak leaves in areas unaffected by gypsy moths were found to have higher levels of tannin on average than aspen leaves. This comparison is irrelevant. They were uh, in the passage. I nowhere see there was nowhere given comparison given between tannin and aspen leaves. So B is definitely not the answer. The survival rate of gypsy moth caterpillars exposed to the wilt virus was 40% higher for those that fed on aspen leaves. Survival rate and aspen leaves, uh, this is not the answer. Female gypsy moths produced an average of 25% fewer eggs in areas where the wilt virus flourished than did moths in areas that were free of the virus. No, the wilt virus and phenols are different things. This cannot be said the correct answer. Gypsy moth egg clusters deposited on oak trees were found to be relatively large individual eggs compared to those deposited on aspen trees. This is also irrelevant. So... The correct answer is option number A. Option E is out of scope. And now we will understand why A is the correct answer because it is said the 50% defoliated trees. The 50% defoliated trees means they, have, they are poisonous and the tree has given uh, also affected its... When the tree was affected, it... Uh, it activated its, its defense mechanism and phenols was produced. So 50% defoliated means 50% more poisonous. And then if the phenols are secreted in defense, the size of the caterpillars will be less. As it is given, the caterpillars were two-thirds of the size. So only four can be logically concluded. Which of the following best describes the function of the third paragraph of the passage? It resolves a contradiction between the ideas presented in the first and second paragraphs. There was no contradiction given in the first place. It introduces research data to support the theory outlined in the second paragraph. No, wild virus disease was given in the second paragraph and there was no research data in the third paragraph. It draws a conclusion from conflicting evidence presented in first two paragraphs. No, no conflicting evidence was given. It shows how phenomena described in the first and second paragraphs act in combination. Yes, this is the answer. Because in the first paragraph, we saw how phenols act. In the second, we saw how wild virus is working. And in the third, we saw how when they both combine, they work. Like phenols can be harmful, but when they are consumed in a combination with the wild virus, they are actually more used full than harmful. Let's read the last option. It elaborates on the thesis produced in the first paragraph. No. So clearly D is the correct answer. It can be inferred from the passage that gypsy moth caterpillars become immune to the wilt virus as a result of consuming a wide range of nutrients from a variety of leaf types, feeding on leaves that contain high levels of phen phenols, this is the answer. We clearly saw in the passage that uh, gypsy moth caterpillars were becoming immune to the wilt virus as a result of phenons. It was given in the third paragraph. This is the last question of the first paragraph. Which of the following statements about gypsy moth caterpillars is supported by information presented in the passage? Wilt disease is more likely to strike more small gypsy moth caterpillars than large ones? No, this is irrelevant. The concentration of phenols in tree leaves increases as the gypsy moth caterpillar population dies off? No. Oh, this is possible, but let's see the other options. Female gypsy moth caterpillars stop growing after they ingest leaves containing phenols. No, they don't stop growing. They grow, but in a size, to a size that was lesser than before. That is lesser than before.
Differing concentrations of phenols in leaves have differing effects on the ability of the wilt virus to kill gypsy moth caterpillars. The longer a gypsy moth population is exposed to wilt disease, the greater like the likelihood that the gypsy moth caterpillars will become immune to the virus. This was not given in the passage. Differing concentrations of phenols in leaves have different effects on the ability of wilt virus. This is highly probable as it was given in the third paragraph that higher the concentration of phenols, the lesser they will die by the wilt virus. So option D is the correct answer of question number 7. Let's move on to the next paragraph. This is a small paragraph. Let's read but, but an interesting one. The storms most studied by climatologists have been those that are most easily understood by taking atmospheric measurements. Hurricanes and tornadoes, for example, are spatially confined. The forces that drive them are highly concentrated and they have distinctive forms and readily quantifiable characteristics. Consequently, data about them are abundant and their behavior is relatively well understood, although still difficult to predict. So this is a very easy para. Here it is being said that climatologists study the storms which, are, which can be measured in numerical terms. Otherwise, it is not possible possible to study natural phenomena. Here it is said that data about those storms are abundant which can be measured in numerical terms but still natural phenomena are very difficult to predict. Hurricanes and tornadoes are also studied because they are highly destructive storms and knowledge about their behavior can help minimize injury to people and property. But other equally destructive storms have not been so thoroughly researched perhaps because they are more difficult to study. A primary example is the Northeaster, a type of coastal storm that causes significant damage along the eastern coast of North America. Northeasters whose uh, Northeasters whose diffuse nature makes them difficult to categorize are relatively weak low pressure systems with winds that rarely acquire the strength of even the smallest hurricane. Although Northeasters are perceived to be less destructive than other storms, the high waves associated with strong Northeasters can cause damage comparable to that of a hurricane because they can affect stretches of coast more than 1500 kilometers long whereas hurricane typically threaten a relatively small ribbon of coastline roughly 100 to 150 meters this is also a very easy para here it is being said that hurricanes and tornadoes are studied because if we have information about them prior to them happening then we can minimize injury to people and property but other equally destructive storms that have not been studied are given and one example of it is given as the northeaster storm in north america the first question is, the primary purpose of the passage is to evaluate the relative amounts of damage caused by different storm types. No, there was no prominent comparison given. Describe the difficulties of classifying destructive storms by type. Absolutely irrelevant. Examine the relationship between wave height and destructive potential storms. No, uh, this is also absolutely irrelevant. Discuss a theory that explains the origins of violent storms irrelevant there was no origin discussed so by elimination we see e is the correct answer discuss reasons why certain types of storms receive more study than others yes this is precisely the reason this is precisely the primary purpose of the passage the next question according to the passage which of the following is true of northeasters northeasters is the example that was given in the passage they have only recently been identified as a distinct storm type this was mentioned nowhere there are more destructive they are more destructive than tornadoes this was also not given anywhere they are low pressure systems no they affect a relatively small segment of the eastern coast of north America this is not the their winds are typically as strong as those of small hurricanes this is a probable answer but I think C is also a probable answer so let's read the two options again they are low pressure systems their winds are typically as strong as those of small hurricanes is true I think E is the correct answer 
Let's move with E. Let's see the next question. Which of the following can be inferred from the passage about storms that lend themselves to atmospheric measurements? They are more likely than other storms to be studied by climatologists. A is the correct answer. This was clearly given in the whole passage. Like this was the main point of the passage. No use reading the other options. This is the last question from this passage. Let's see. With which of the following statements about northeasters would the author of the passage most likely to most likely agree? Even increased knowledge about the behavior of northeasters is unlikely to reduce the injury to people and property that they cause. No, this is absolutely opposite to what the passage says. The passage says if we have prior knowledge, we can prevent loss. Northeasters are deserving of closer study by climatologists than they have been received in the past. This is possible. Damage caused by northeasters is less easily assessed than damage caused by hurricanes. This is not. Northeasters are more difficult to study than hurricanes and tornadoes because northeasters occur less often. No. Northeasters are too diffuse to warrant close study by climatologists. This option may seem confusing, but C and E are not the answers. B is clearly the answers answer because northeasters was given in the example of the tornadoes that are harmful but have not been studied. So, the, so they deserve a closer study by climatologists than they have received in the past. This is the next paragraph. Let's read it. Arguments abound over whether marijuana should be legalized. Many of these arguments pertain to the lengthy federal guidelines for prison sentences meted out for what is considered a relatively petty crime. Others point out that marijuana is a drug that could and should be used for medicina medicinal purposes. But most proponents of legalization ignore the mounting evidence which points to the long-term damage to the user and for society as a whole. In the Netherlands, marijuana has been legally available since 1976. Coffee shops sell cannabis over the counter in many parts of the country. However, more people have tried cannabis since it has been legalized. Now, in the first paragraph, it is being said the arguments over whether marijuana should be legalized. Here it is given that those who say that it should not be legalized say so to protect the people and the society from the harmful effects of being addicted to something. And the people who are proponents are ignoring a fact that if it is legally available and it is not legally a crime, more people would like to try these things which are harmful to themselves. Medical research has repeatedly provided evidence that marijuana use causes permanent physical, psychological and thus emotional damage to those who regularly use it. Studies at the University of Maryland and UCLA indicated that the regular smoking of only two marijuana cigarettes a day would tend to promote toe fungus and thrush. But over the years, much stronger claims have surfaced. Heavy marijuana users perform poorly at work or school, are more likely to be delinquent and develop psychiatric, problem, psychiatric problems or have abnormal brain waves. Repeatedly, however, such studies encourage Counter the same objection are the problems caused by smoking marijuana or is it just that the people with problems are more likely to end up using marijuana heavily. So this paragraph gives the negative effects of marijuana and then the author argues that it is also possible that people who already had those effects or problems with themselves are the users of marijuana and it is not actually the thing that is causing those effects to them. Marijuana is addictive. According to Wayne Hall, director of the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, cannabis is not generally regarded as a drug of dependence because it does not have a clearly defined withdrawal syndrome, but that, he says, is an old-fashioned definition of addiction. Research into marijuana's use as a medicine has proven either inclusive or tended to show that it its side effects rendered cannabis unsuitable as a drug. For instance, one study surveyed the use of cannabinoids to combat nausea 
following chemotherapy. While the tablets or injections were slightly more effective than standard treatments, their side effects plus the recent development of new, more powerful drugs makes them a poor choice for nausea. Cannabinoids were relief. In relief, in her study, more effective than codeine in controlling acute and chronic pain, and they had undesirable effects in depressing the central nervous system. Comments Aja Kalso of Hensky University Hospital. Yet under mounting pressure, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency has reluctantly agreed to provide funds for once again testing the efficacy of marijuana as a medicine. This paragraph mainly deals with whether marijuana can be used as a drug or not in medicines, but it says it has more side effects than the cure it can probably do. Let's see the first question of this paragraph. According to the passage, all of the following are harmful effects of marijuana except a poor performance at work, development of psychiatrist problem, growth of toe fungus and thrush, all these were given, depression, depression and memory loss, abnormal brain waves. A, B, C and E were clearly mentioned in the passage, so option D is the correct answer. According to an earlier definition, why is marijuana not considered addictive? It does not result in death, lack of clearly defined withdrawal syndrome. This was given in the second paragraph. B is the correct answer that the lack of clearly defined withdrawal symptom is the reason why marijuana is not considered addictive according to the previous definition that existed. This is the last question from the paragraph. Which of the following can be inferred from the information in the passage? It has now been proved without a doubt that marijuana is indeed harmful to humans. Marijuana has been unreasonably criticized by doctors. Netherlands will soon make marijuana legal. No, it is already legal. Unreasonably, it was not criticized. It has severe side effects. Proved is, harm is indeed harmful. No, it has not been proved without a doubt. There is doubt. That's why the entire para was given. By elimination, we can see D is the answer. But otherwise also, let's read D once. Marijuana has several harmful effects and probably some beneficial ones as well. The US Drug Enforcement Agency has decided to ban the use of marijuana. This was clearly given in the last paragraph. So option D is the correct answer. This is a very short para but the most interesting one according to me. Let's read this. You can't chop vegetables, slice meat or whip up a cake batter if you can't even fit a cutting board or a mixing bowl on your counter. So to take a good look at your countertops. What's on them? Coffee makers, blenders, food processors, rack of spice jars or canisters of flour and sugar, stacks of bills, permission slips and grade school art projects. Is your countertop doubling as a magazine rack, plant holder or wine rack? Consider this. Your kitchen counters aren't meant to be storage units. They are meant to be food preparation areas. A clean, clear counter space can inspire the creation of a great meal. A cluttered one is more likely to inspire a call to the pizza delivery guy. <laughs> if your kitchen counter is clustered with paraphernalia beyond usefulness, that's a problem you can fix. The ultimate test for whether something should be allowed valuable countertop real estate is how often you use it. If you use an appliance or food ingredient like coffee or flour almost every day, then go ahead and give it a hallowed ground. Otherwise, stow it. Be ruthless. Put away the mixer, the food processor, the bread machine and the rice cooker. Away with the herb and spice rack, the bottles of nut oil and fancy vinegar. Find a better spot for the mail and the bills. As you rid your counters of this clutter, you also get rid of your excuses for not having Having the space to cook dinner. This was a very easy paragraph, so I don't think I need to break it down for you. Let's straight jump straight away jump into the questions. The highlighted sentence in the passage is included for what likely purpose? The highlighted sentence was the coffee makers, counters, that, that line was the highlighted one. The author is suggesting appropriate items to keep on your countertop. The author is mocking American capitalism. This is absolutely irrelevant. The author is pointing out common safety hazards. There was nothing said of safety in the passage. The author is gently teasing readers about the items 
items that they might be storing on their kitchen counters instead of using the counters for cooking this is the answer as you can go back to the passage and see clearly that line was given to tease the passage is given in a very funny way so it was given to tease the re readers about the items that they might be keeping in their counter tops instead of keeping the useful items that are needed for cooking which of the following would be the best title for this passage here are the basics you need to start cooking no the author was not teaching us anything about cooking coffee and flour are the building blocks of the kitchen no it was not said anywhere cleaning off your counter gets you re ready to cook it should not be your it should be you but I think this is the answer. No one considers the lowly kitchen counter. No, this is not the answer. Let's get your house organized. No, the most appropriate title would be option number C. The second paragraph of the passage would be most likely to be helpful to someone who is trying to give up copy, coffee, irrelevant, unsure about whether to keep their deep fryer on their kitchen counter even though it is only used once a month. This is a very probable answer. Looking for an organizational system to coral all of their loose papers? No. Remodeling their kitchen? No. Not sure if they want to cook at home more often or no. No. The correct answer is B as the author says that only those items which are used on an everyday basis should be given the valuable space on your countertop. Otherwise, you have to be ruthless and remove them from that valuable space so option b is the correct answer based on the passage it can reasonably be inferred that the authors approve of which of the following ideas planning a monthly menu this is irrelevant shopping for produce and other ingredients locally there was nothing mentioned of shopping locally or anything keeping a kitchen spice collection down to a half dozen instead of 20 or more spices or the author did not specify any number particular in particular encouraging families to cook together there was no talk of family time together maintaining a clutter free kitchen so it is usable whenever cooking inspiration strikes this is exactly what the passage is about this was the main idea of the passage so let's see the next question according to the passage where do the mail and the bill belongs on the kitchen counter belong on the kitchen counter no that is exactly what the author is protesting against on the dining room table no neatly sorted irrelevant it should be sorted but the author didn't say anything about it not specified but not on a kitchen counter this is the most probable answer but let's read the other option too they should be recycled as soon as possible very much irrelevant so option d is the correct answer this was the last question from this passage and this was the last passage of today's session if you have any doubts related uh, relating to the passages we did today feel free to drop your doubts in the comment section below i will be very happy to answer them and let's wrap up the session here thank you